Between 1989 and 1995, the NASCAR Sportsman Division allowed for short track drivers to race at the same tracks as their idols using tuned down Winston Cup cars. What began as a great idea was quickly marred by heavy accidents, odd occurrences, driver injuries, and was wrapped up by a truly catastrophic accident at the end. The NASCAR Sportsman Division was first announced in January 1989. Conceived by Charlotte Motor Speedway President Humpy Wheeler, the NASCAR Sportsman Division was originally conceived as a set of exhibition races to be held during the NASCAR Winston Cup's trips to Charlotte in May and October. Former Bush cars from between 1975 and 1986 were eligible to race in Sportsman, as were former Winston Cup cars from between 1982 and 1986. All cars had to use two barrel carburetors to keep speeds down. The goal of the division was to allow for short track drivers to race at the big speedways for low cost. Baby scared them to death, so uh, yeah, they had a rookie beating, and they had about four five beating. I think they'll get in at least four or five laps before they have a problem. Then somebody's going to say, "Heck, this is no good." When they put their foot down, stand back because it could be the 4th of July for Memorial Day here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Well, we're door to door going into turn one. They're off to a very respectable start, and Ward Burton, 27 years old, out of Halifax, uh, Virginia, out in front, started the go kart when he was 11 years old. Gets himself a very good start. They're being very careful. Them, the Old and New Testament about how to run around this track the other day, and then he had the drivers come in, and by the time they got done, they were more pale than if they had run 600 miles under very rigorous conditions. South Boston Speedway regular Ward Burton sat on the pole for the inaugural sportsman race, the Super Speedway 150, held May 24th, 1989. On his outside, New York's Tim Bender, a snowmobile racing expert, giving stock cars a shot. Drag bike racer Mark Cox started third. Alongside him was Todd Bedine, the youngest of the Bedine brothers. Dennis Setzer rounded out the top five. Starting seventh was Jack Sprague in a Chevrolet owned by local race car builder Robert Hamke. Other notable names in the field included, but were not limited to, Richie Petty, the nephew of Richard Petty and son of Maurice. Henry Benfield, Ken Schrader's gasman, he actually had Ken on the spotter stand. Robert Huffman, a local rising star in an Oldsmobile sponsored by Earnhardt Chevrolet. Pete Pistone, a sports journalist who was Tiger Tom Pistone's nephew. Kirk Schomerdine, Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. And a whole cavalry of other racers, veterans and rookies alike. They even had a Canadian in the field in Doug Diderot. The race was expected to be a crash fest, and Todd Bodine's spin on lap 2 certainly didn't help to alleviate those fears. However, from there, the race was actually quite calm, with a couple caution flags here and there for minor incidents. On lap 82, Ward Burton, who had dominated most of the race up to that point, lost a tire and spun his car. After that, Jack Sprague endured the remaining two cautions, both caused by Phil Rogers, and took the win. Sprague's jubilation didn't last too long, as the Concord Speedway regular was disqualified that night. Tim Bender was awarded the official victory. A post-race inspection found that Sprague's heads were too small. Smaller heads increase the compression of the engine, thus raising horsepower. NASCAR believed that Sprague was not aware of these smaller heads. In any case, the Sportsman boys had put on one heck of a show, and everyone geared up for the return trip in October. Held on October 4th, 1989, the Wisconsin Mills Sportsman 150 saw a couple of unfortunate firsts. Saw the series' first injury in Dwight Cass of Union Grove, North Carolina, who broke his shoulder in an early crash, and the series' first major pileup, which took eight cars out of the race. Tim Bender won the race in a mostly dominant performance, however he wouldn't be getting any champion spoils, as there was no points table in 1989.
The 1990 sportsman division was one of expansion as the series ventured out to Richmond and New Hampshire. But it was also a year of tragedy. On May 16, 1990, during a practice session ahead of the May sportsman festivities, a violent crash took the life of a driver. 27-year-old David Gaines of Goldston, North Carolina was struck by Steve McCachern after Gaines had spun during a pileup. The impact sent debris into Gaines's cockpit, instantly killing him. This crash showed one of the big problems with the sportsman division. To save money, sportsman cars used old tire compounds that had once been used by cut teams at super speedways. They were cheap, but they warmed up very quickly, severely inhibiting a driver's ability to slow down for a crash. Due to this and how thin Charlotte is, many drivers simply panicked when a crash broke out. The rest of the May races and the New Hampshire race went pretty smoothly. October, however, was when the destruction started. So many accidents! Both races saw several pileups break out, and neither race had more than 25 cars running at the finish. Thankfully, no drivers were injured after these pileups. But the next time I stopped by Charlotte, some drivers wouldn't be as lucky. The 1991 Sportsman Division saw the cars go to a brand new track, Pocono. Pocono would become a mainstay for the rest of the division's run. New Hampshire was off the schedule and would never be back on. We also saw one of the more interesting moments in the division's history involving a dirt tracker from South Carolina named Phil Ross. Philip Ross slid into an opening in the pit road wall, his car exploding into a fireball. As the flames spread, it appeared Ross would be unable to escape in time. Suddenly, he emerged from the passenger side window, crawling through the inferno and to safety. He was flown to a local hospital where he was treated for second degree burns on 30% of his body. The race was restarted and eventually won by Dennis Setzer. On May 18, 1991, Phil Ross of Greer, South Carolina, spun his car off of turn four and enter the pit lane during a heat race ahead of the May sportsman festivities. The car backed into an opening in the pit wall, causing it to explode. Ross spent 25 seconds in the burning car before evacuating out the passenger window. Safety crews were criticized for not responding quickly enough. They explained that the fire had spread to one of the safety vehicles, and they were dealing with that. The crash is believed to have been caused by Ross running over some debris laid down by an earlier pileup. His pileup sent drivers Mike Gowdy and Doug Gold to the hospital, neither with serious injuries. Ross retired from racing from his hospital bed. In the meantime, the destruction continued. Bill Metzger of Deer Park, New York was injured in a crash during the main event. This big smash during race 2 forced Richie Petty to go to the hospital for x-rays. And this violent accident during race 3 sent both Ed Gardner Jr. of New Jersey and Tom Deeth powerboat racing legend from Michigan to the hospital, both with broken bones. Not even the inaugural Pocono race held in July would be very clean, as it saw a pileup on lap 52 which ended the race, but no one was injured. NASCAR themselves admitted maybe the division had gotten a little too big, but that doesn't mean they were going to downsize it, in fact, the division was only going to grow. The days of complete unknowns like Mike Carver and John Kendall racing in the division were almost over, and recognizable short track names such as Scott Kilby and Chris Diamond were in. Local short tracker Russell Phillips had also recently joined the division. No one knew it at the time, but he would be pivotal in the division's downfall.
Coming with the 1992 Sportsman opener were a few stories. Igloo Coolers had hopped aboard as the division sponsor, and there was going to be both a point system and a champion. Second up, Jerry Glanville, the Atlanta Falcons coach, had decided to give racing a shot and was getting his start in the sportsman division. The third note was much more tragic. On May 15, 1992, during the last chance qualifier for the sportsman opener, 40-year-old Gary Batson of Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, was badly burned in an incident. The crash, which started when Red Everett spun his car, saw Neil Cannell Jr. check up into Batson, pinning Batson's car on its side up against the wall. It soon burst into flames, and he was unable to evacuate. Batson spent about a minute inside the car, before the fire was brought under control, suffered heavy burns across most of his body, and died the next day. The crash was ruled a freak accident, but it was supplemented by an incredible irony that Batson was using the same car as Phil Ross had been when he crashed the year prior. Of course, the racing continued. This last chance qualifier was actually the very first race ever held under the lights at Charlotte, and the main event was an undercard to the Winston, as it had been the past two years. Robbie Faggart won the race, leading every lap. It was marred by a heavy incident where Lee Tissett piled into Larry Cottle's stopped car on the backstretch. Cottle was surprisingly okay, but Tissett had to go to the hospital. Local racer Danny Sykes' escapades during the three races were almost worthy of Hollywood. He was parked from race two before the race had even started after refusing to go to the back of the field because he had missed a driver's meeting, and then he rode his car off in this fiery crash during race three after being hit by Jerry Rector and Jerry Knowles. He wasn't injured. Robbie Faggart was the 1992 sportsman champion. Two more drivers would head to the hospital after crashes that year. Steve Allison of Oklahoma uh, hit the front stretch wall during race three and was hospitalized for bruising. And this big hit during the sportsman finale that year sent Mark Purcell of Watertown, New York to the hospital with busted sternum. By this point, the sportsman division had established itself as a series known for nothing but wrecks. But NASCAR wasn't about to let it go. He had one more idea, and they had every reason to institute it. Igloo dropped their sponsorship for 1993, however the division continued to use a points table. During the first race, Sherry Minner spun in front of the leaders, resulting in this violent accident that ended the race. And the second race saw this. Second place starter Peter Gibbons, third place starter Michael Dawkin, fourth place starter Garland Hopgood, fifth place starter Ronnie Sewell, there were just four of the ten cars wiped out in the second lap crash. By this point, organizers had had enough, and decided that for race three, the division would employ a single file initial start, which clearly worked, considering the next two races went caution free. Hang on a second, a sportsman race caution free? Believe it or not, yes. It also saw a great fuel mileage race at Pocono, where Jerry Knowles was able to stretch his fuel for 150 miles. Unfortunately, the next three races saw their cautions and some actually rather heavy hits. But it was still pretty good progress for a series that was seen mostly as a joke. David Smith of Spartanburg, South Carolina won the Sportsman Championship in 1993. This would be the last year that the division handed out a title. It would go back to being an exhibition series in 1994. The series had improved upon its very, very, very violent first couple years, but more violence was yet to come.
The big news story heading into the 1994 season was that David Smith had sold his championship winning Monte Carlo to a driver also named David Smith. The new David Smith, a dirt tracker from Florida, was called David R. Smith in the broadcasts. Race 2 saw a couple of heavy incidents, including this one where John Stroud was turned around in front of everybody, and an incident the cameras didn't capture where Glenn Darnell's car shot out sideways and cracked open the wall. No one was injured after these hits, but Robert Wooten wasn't as lucky. He suffered a concussion after testing out the water barrels a few laps later. During race 3, Red Everett spun his car off of turn 4 and was plowed by Ronnie Sewell. The crash caused Everett's car to explode into flames, however, he wasn't injured beyond light burns. A crash on the restart between Sherry Blakely and Rounder Severance sent Severance to the hospital, along with two crew members who were hit by a flying axle. During race 5 at Pocono, Russ Galindo spun his car in turn 1 and was hit full bore by Doug Bennett. Another driver was injured. Wally Fowler initially swept both races at Pocono, which, due to a rainout in June, were held within two days of one another in July. However, he would be disqualified from both due to what drivers called a hilariously illegal engine. Race 6 saw an odd story where Joe Guida's car blew up in practice, and Guida hopped in teammate Henry Benfield's car. Scores were not formed and still scored Benfield in the car. It appears the broadcast crew was told. All in all, the sportsman division had done pretty well for itself in 1994. There had been a couple hard hits, but drivers had had great times and the racing had been high quality. 1995, however, would see the undoing of all the progress the division had made. There was an especially interesting entrant into the May 1995 festivities. Maurizio Michangeli of Italy had seen NASCAR on television and made the trip over to participate. Unfortunately, he wrecked in practice and would not take the start. During race two, Don Satterfield of Spartanburg uh, suffered a broken pinky finger and a heavy turn for shunt. And a big pileup during race three lit Mickey Hudspeth's car on fire. He wasn't injured, however. Come late 1995, NASCAR had started to wonder what to do with the division. Sure, the division still had a lot of regulars, and they still put on great shows, but the whole idea of throwing inexperienced short trackers on big tricky tracks and telling them to acclimate was no longer as appealing as it once had been. NASCAR received their answer as to what to do with the division on October 6th. Unfortunately, it came in the form of the most horrifying crash in NASCAR history. It had been an up and down seven years for the NASCAR Sportsman division, and while by 1995 everyone seemed content with how the series was going, NASCAR wasn't so sure what to do next. The drivers were still putting on good shows, with large entry lists often topping 50 or 55. However, safety had improved by leaps and bounds over the past couple years, and it was no longer always the driver's fault if they were injured. Russell Phillips had seen some heavy accents, Concord Speedway regular and Mint Hill, North Carolina native, had been in sportsman since 1990. A truck detailer by trade, Phillips had been finding speed after years in the midfield, and was looking to improve on his best finish of 8th. He sure showed that speed during qualifying for the Winston 100 on October 3rd, as he was the fastest of the 53 entries. Unfortunately, he would have to wait a couple of days in order to show his stuff, as Hurricane Opal washed out all activity at the track on Wednesday, October 4th, and Thursday, October 5th. The rain continued through a Friday, October 6th. However, it began to clear up 
and NASCAR decided that they would get in the Winston 100 at 4 p.m. The race was supposed to have been broadcast live by World Sports at 9 p.m. Wednesday, but with their weekend schedules filled, they decided to film the race and show it on tape delay over the next couple days. Russell was confident that the number 57 Hendrix Office Machines Oldsmobile Cutlass would be running up with the leaders at race's end. However, he only led the first two laps before being passed by Lester Lesneski and Gary Layton, after which he plummeted through the field. He was able to hold station in 10th, racing with Ronnie Sewell and Stephen Howard. Howard, a 21-year-old from Greer, South Carolina, running for a family team, had been around the sportsman circuit for about a year. He had already proven his talent at the Greenville Pick and Speedway, in which he had a couple of feature wins. Exactly where Russell got his chassis from isn't known for sure, though both Bobby Allison and Daryl Waltrip's names have been thrown around. However, it is known that Russell worked on his car with help from James Finch. Finch, whose team, Phoenix Racing, was at the time of part-time Bush Series campaign with driver Jeff Purvis, employed Russell's older brother John as a tire changer. According to fellow driver Robin Caldwell, however, all was not well in the garage. Drivers were very suspicious of Russell's car, believing that he had drilled holes in his roll cage or that he had an improper engine. They had considered going to NASCAR with their beliefs, but had decided not to. The sportsman division was the precursor to Winston Cup, after all, and any drama or politics would just leave fans with bad tastes in their mouths. Besides, the fans had waited long enough for a race, they had endured the heavy rains and strong winds brought about by Hurricane Opal. All they wanted was a show, and a show was what they were going to get. Unfortunately, the only thing that this show would be remembered for was what happened at quarter distance. Yorktown, Virginia's Joe Guida had already made the headlines for his little switcheroo, and he pulled with Henry Benfield the year prior. However, his first full year of racing sportsman full-time for his own team hadn't gone too well, though he was slowly picking up speed. In the meantime, the Waycasters, a husband and wife who owned both a race team and a restaurant, had entered sportsman at the beginning of 1995. Their driver had originally been Dale McDowell, a dirt late model expert, but Dale never got to grips with their Oldsmobile despite having asphalt experience in Arca, and he left the team after May. Morris Spice of Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, a fellow dirt late model racer, was penciled in in his place. The two started the Winston 100 nearby one another and battled for most of the beginning of the race. On lap 17, they collided and spun off of turn 4. Ronnie Sewell was the first on scene, and he chose to floor it by the crash. Stephen Howard got on scene, he chose to slow down and swerve up the track, but Russell had chosen to floor it, and for whatever reason, he was descending the track slightly. The two cars collided, Russell's left front hitting Stephen's right rear, and carried each other into the wall. The two flipped onto their sides, Russell's car going passenger door down, and Stephen's on his driver's door, and upon hitting the catch fence, Russell's roof was torn away. This dealt Russell catastrophic head injuries, and he died instantly. The two cars then came back down to earth, Russell's car doing a full rollover, and they slid to a stop, still together, in the quad oval. Jeffrey Neneman of Dallas, North Carolina, and Louis Littlepage of Mechanicsville, Virginia spun their cars in response to the crash. Neither hit anything. Howard, shaken by and hurt, hopped out of his car and ran into the infield under his own power, and Guy and Bice refired their own cars. Marshall ran over to Russell's car and emptied their fire extinguisher on it, but upon looking inside the cockpit, they realized not much could be done. In what is often considered the most gruesome crash in NASCAR history, Russell had been decapitated by a caution light that had pierced through the collapsing windshield and had been brutally dismembered by the catch fence itself. It is hard to discern exactly what was left behind given all the debris on the track, however, whatever it was, it was truly a horrifying sight. Track workers were forced to put up sheets along the catch fence so fans didn't have to watch the cleanup, a task they carried out with surgical gloves. Perhaps most chillingly, when they scaled the turn fork catch fence, 
in place of the caution light, they found both Russell's window net and his right hand. The scene remains the most brutal in NASCAR history. Despite this, after a 33 minute red flag so the cleanup could be completed and an investigation could be carried out, the race was finished up and was won by Gary Layton. Despite the fact that the weekend was finished up, it was pretty clear that the sportsman division would not be recovering from the death of Russell Phillips. On November 29th, Charlotte Motor Speedway President Humpy Wheeler called off all future sportsman races. No official announcement regarding Pocono was ever made, but the division was done for. The May Charlotte festivities were replaced by a set of ARCA races in 1996. The October festivities were scrapped entirely. A few short track races were held in 1996, however most drivers had migrated to what would become the Hooters Pro Cup Series, so NASCAR dropped these races after that year. For a few years, the Hooters Pro Cup Series did use the same old car format, however new rules and regulations introduced in 1998 led to teams building their own cars. During this time, a fix had been made to make sure that what befell Russell Phillips could never happen again, the Earnhardt Bar. In 1996, Dale Earnhardt was hooked head-on into the wall at Talladega, and his roof collapsed. Despite this, he survived with non-life-threatening injuries, and an extra support was added to the car's windshield. It has been upgraded several times over the past couple years, most notably with Ryan Newman's crash in 2009. The Earnhardt bar and the Newman bar have already proven their worth, and hopefully they will continue to do so in the future. The division which gave us Jason Keller, Todd Bedine, Ward Burton, and Mike Skinner was dead. However, it left behind quite the legacy and gave many short track drivers chances to race at the big tracks which they would normally have no chance of even dreaming of. Over 250 different drivers raced in the sportsman division at one point or another, and they came from all over. All drivers needed to race in the sportsman division were a standard driver's license, which actually isn't necessary today, a super speedway license, and a NASCAR racing license. The latter two could be gotten through the various racing schools in the area, such as Fast Track Driving School, owned by Andy Hillenberg. Bob Fox Jr. had little to no racing experience before signing up for Fast Track, however in the sportsman division, he was very quick. Franklin Square New York metalworker operated his own team using his life savings. Glenn Barnell also had little to no racing experience before signing up for Fast Track, however the retired businessman from McDowell, Virginia was also pretty quick when he raced, despite being well into his 60s. Robin Caldwell of Chesney, South Carolina was not particularly quick in the sportsman division. Caldwell, by trade an airbrush artist who frequented his local dirt tracks on the weekends, sure had the prettiest paint scheme in the garage. Sherry Minter of Martinsville, Virginia was already involved in racing, being the wife of Harry Melling mechanic Tommy Johnson. She was very fast, but never seemed to finish the race, usually due to getting caught up in other people's messes. Gary Everett of Fair Forest, South Carolina was another driver who always seemed to get caught up in other people's garbage. Nicknamed Red, Everett, who owned a restaurant as a day job, operated one of the very few two-car teams in Sportsman. His teammate was Jerry Rector, a highly experienced short tracker, also from South Carolina. Speaking of age, the oldest Sportsman driver was indeed Glenn Darnell, at 64. The youngest was 19-year-old Phil Rogers from Charlotte. Three different women competed in the division at one point or another. Minter, Australia's Terry Sawyer, 
and Sherry Blakely of Texas. Most drivers had come up through the area's dirt and paved ovals. However, some people had more unique backgrounds. Tim Bender was a snowmobile racing legend. Mark Cox raced drag bikes. And Paul Shaver, a businessman from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, had raced airplanes, trophy trucks, and Formula Renault in France. There are a couple sportsman drivers who still take to the local short tracks from time to time, such as Tim Neighbors, Tuck Trenum, Marty Ward, and Wally Fowler. If one knew where to look and was not concerned with their speed, then a sportsman campaign usually cost about $12,500 at the very least, which isn't half bad. The go-to model in the sportsman division was the Chevrolet Monte Carlo. These cars were cheap, more aerodynamic than their appearance would have you think, and quite reliable and easy to get to grips with. Chevy Luminas were very rare in sportsmen as they were usually too expensive, however they were used a little bit at the end. Only a handful of drivers used Ford Thunderbirds, however two of the drivers that used them were Dennis Setzer and Henry Benfield, so there was usually at least one Ford in the field, usually only one. Pontiac Grand Prix were very common towards the beginning, but as the division wore on, they became less and less common. Only one driver, Charles Schaffner, used one in 1994, and no one used one in 95. Automobile cutlasses were infrequent, if not rare, for most of the division. However, in 1994, teams gained access to the new style of body, which cup teams had started using in 1988, and the Oldsmobile really took off in the division. There were always a few Buicks in the field. Usually they used the Sabres, however, towards the beginning a couple used Skylarks, and towards the end a couple used the Regal. NASCAR normally did not allow the Chrysler LeBaron in the high leagues, however, it was permitted in the lower leagues, and Michael Lovatera of Connecticut used one in a few Pocono races in 93 and 94. It is possible that the Chevy Nova, the Oldsmobile Omega, and the Pontiac Ventura saw some use in the first couple races, but this isn't known for sure, and if they did, they were phased out pretty quickly. Alright, this next section is going to be a montage. Five minutes of random facts, odds and ends about the sportsman division. Here we go. A couple of sportsman cars still exist, such as Chip Kreider's Ford Thunderbird, which appears to be on display somewhere, and Richie Petty's Chevrolet that he wrecked in 1991, which was found in a barn a couple years ago, and is currently being restored. Occasional road ringer Roger Roos raced in Sportsman, using a rear-steer Buick once used by Bobby Allison as a test car. Apparently, this car is also still around, sitting in someone's private collection. Nine of the 40 drivers who started the first Sportsman race never ran another one. The previously mentioned Charles Schaffner later started a race team, and owned the car that Kevin LePage drove when LePage did this. This guy's name is Derek Countryman. Nothing more to it, I just think that's a cool name. Most sportsman drivers used cars that were 7 or 8 years old, however Robin Caldwell's chassis did back to 1979. It was built as one of the old big cars, so it was a little heavier than everyone else's. Top Cup Racing was a Florida-based racing series in which police officers faced off against one another on local short tracks for charity. Top Cup competitor Fred Costanza ran a couple sportsman races in 93 and 94. Dale LeMans, a racer at Langley Speedway who would later own and die at the track, was the original driver of the 43 before it was purchased by Paul Shaver. Sportsman race winners at Charlotte, such as Ronnie Sewell here, received this as their trophy. Apparently, Wally Fowler bailed out of Pocono in 1994 on an airplane before tech had been completed. He knew his car was illegal. This spin by Kent Raider crewman Henry Benfield during the Sportsman opener was apparently on purpose after he misheard an instruction from his crew chief. For some sportsman drivers, it was evident where they got their cars from. James Lamoureux's car was clearly the old Hell and Ray Special once run by Dave Marcus, and Shot Howard's car was clearly an old Dale Earnhardt car, as evident by the Silver Stripes. 
Robert Wooten Chevrolet was once a Pontiac Ventura barrel rolled by Rodney Howard during the Bush race at Daytona in 1983. Tim Hepler's car was the same one Terry Labonte used to win the 1988 Winston. And the Care Day Storm Monte Carlo that Sherry Minner had all her success in was a former Jeff Bedine Levi Garrett car. This car is also still around. It's back in its old colors sitting in the Hendrick Museum. Marty Ward, Tom Sherrill, and Jerry Rector were the only three drivers who ran at least one sportsman race every year. Meanwhile, Rector and Robbie Faggart were the only two to run both the opener and the finale. As with the short tracks, most sportsman teams were simply named Last Name Racing or Last Name Motorsports, with a few exceptions, such as the adorable Mom and Dad Racing, which Danny Mathis ran for. New York dirt tracker Wyatt Earp III rented out the Days of Thunder car to race in Sportsman in October 1990. He finished midfield. Sportsman sponsors included Ramsey's Condoms on the car of Sherry Blakely, Trotter Bail Bonds on the car of Jerry Rector, and Horseplay Western Apparel on the car of Ronnie Sewell. Sportsman purses varied, but were usually around $30,000, with $3,000 going to the winner. Here was Ward Burton before the first sportsman race. Ward's pretty famous for his accent. Did he have it when he was 27? Well, I'm looking real forward to it. You know, I, I just hope everybody uses their head and uh, then try to win on the first lap. David Showers of St. Augustine, Florida had a frustrating October 1991. He was set to make his debut in the first race of the doubleheader, only for Rain to watch that race out. And then he wrote the car off while trying to qualify for the second race. Sportsman races were a very low priority held at times such as 11 in the morning on a Saturday and 9 at night on a Wednesday. Though later disproven by photos, Red Ever apparently insists to this day that the first person on scene to his big crash in 94 was fellow driver Doug Bennett, who was already out of the race by that point and was presumably standing in the pit lane. American philanthropist and billionaire Leo Hendry did a little sportsman racing in 95. The Greensboro newspaper reported in 1990 that there was a plan to add Daytona to the schedule for 1991. This never happened. Apparently, in 1996... What was that? You want me to talk about the planned Daytona race and how it would have gone? Ah, uh, alright. As mentioned, in 1990, a Greensboro newspaper reported that they were thinking about holding a sportsman race at Daytona in 1991. Obviously, this never happened. It's one of those weird what-ifs of motorsport, kind of like IndyCars at Talladega, though that was cancelled for other reasons. In any case, I think the sportsman race at Daytona would have gone just fine. Let me explain why. This is the qualifying report from the Winston Sportsman 150 in October 1991. This race was rained out and was never held. Take a look at the times here. Kirk Schomerdine's on pole with the 3487, and at the very bottom of the list, Harry Page with a 3907. That is a massive difference. This is from the 1995 Winston 100, the race we lost Russell in. Russell, of course, was the pole sitter with the 3429. At the very bottom of the list, Joey Crisco with a 3831. While there are certainly backmarker teams in Cup, the difference there is that drivers are trained how to stay in the draft. Draft was very important for sportsman races at Charlotte. However, between the different body styles and driver inexperience, it would have been a tall order for drivers to be able to stay in the draft for the entire race at Daytona, where proper aerodynamics is quintessential. And besides, there already was a lower division that ran at Daytona, that being the Goodies Dash series. Dash races were already splits between the haves and the have-nots at Daytona, especially in its older years. However, dash cars were compacts. They could easily shoot out from underneath a driver even with their best effort, due to just how light they were. And remember, sportsman cars used old cup tires, which had once been used at Daytona and Talladega. These tires were cheap and very, very hard, meaning they gripped the track with ease after a short run. As such, I think sportsman cars would put on a very boring show at Daytona, due to just how spread out they would get within the first couple laps. It is possible that there would be a few huge accidents early on, but as long as everyone minded their P's and Q's in the first 10 laps, the race would have gone very cleanly. 
course, all we can do is theorize. Let me know what you think would have happened. The sportsman drivers have gone on to do a variety of different things. Some still race, some don't, and some have unfortunately passed on. Stephen Howard never got over his involvement in Russell's crash. He kept racing for a few years, but retired in 2005. He passed away in 2011 at the age of 36. Sherry Minter stopped racing after 1996. The two sportsman champions, Robbie Fagger and David Smith, both still race. Fagger can be found at Charlotte Motor Speedway running legend cars, and Smith frequents his local short tracks. Tim Bender found a full-time bush ride with Robbie Reiser's team in 1997, but his season ended early at Bristol after a qualifying crash. He was replaced by a young kid named Matt Kenseth. Bender retired afterwards. Gary Layton's career also ended in a big smash during qualifying for a 1998 bush race at Michigan. Joe Guida, one of the two spinners that set off Russell's crash, Ran as a truck independent for a few years, then returned to the short tracks. He's since retired. Morris Bice still races at his local dirt tracks in Tennessee. Kirk Shelmerdine left Richard Childress Racing after 1992 to pursue his own racing career. He raced for about 15 more years, and then retired. He can still be found playing professional poker. Ronnie Sewell can also be found playing pro poker. Lastly, Red Everett is still running that restaurant. He's in his 80s now. Despite its tarnished legacy, the sportsman division did create some big names, and some interesting moments did occur in the series, both good and bad. Also led to the start of the Pro Cup series, which was a classic short tracking division that launched many more careers. In that aspect, it was a success. In the end, perhaps the best description of the sportsman division is a baptism by fire. It put drivers who weren't experienced in big tracks and high speeds in dangerous situations and expected them to react like NASCAR's finest. Some did, others didn't. It served as an interesting case study into what would happen if NASCAR's stars such as Jeff Gordon and Dale Earnhardt weren't as highly trained. On the other hand, if Gordon and Earnhardt had found themselves in the same situation as Phillips and Howard, the crash probably still would have gone the same way, as it was a fault with the car which killed Phillips. Would the division still be going today? Probably not, it probably would have been phased out in the late 90s, but it's an interesting thing to think about. It was a series of its time, a byproduct of the days where the onus to stay safe was on the driver. And yet, even in its last days, the sportsman division kept receiving entrants. Why is that? Why would a series with such a bad reputation still be gaining entries, even in its last days? Well, perhaps Sherry Minter put it best. It was because the sportsman drivers were the Wild Bunch.